years roll back and you are in the Brownstone Theater to attend the performance of Cyrano de Bergerac. It's a theater of memories, this Brownstone Theater. Your own memories, perhaps. For here we present plays you may have enjoyed once upon a time. Plays that have entertained and thrilled many an audience in many a theater. Plays you will still enjoy. in your seat at the Brownstone Theater now, and sitting beside you is the distinguished American drama critic and author, a knowing and charming gentleman, Clayton Hamilton. Good evening. It is always a pleasure to welcome you to the Brownstone Theater, the theater of my memories and your imagination. But tonight I feel a very special pleasure, because we are about to listen to the leading scenes of what has always been to me the most enchanting play in all the world. This is Cyrano de Bergerac, that heroic comedy by Edmond Rostand, which has been rendered magnificently into English verse by Brian Hooker. For this occasion, the members of our Brownstone Theatre Company have invited a guest star. And I have the honor to present to you my dearest friend and one of our foremost actors, Walter Hamden. In the actual theatre, Mr. Hamden has performed the part of Cyrano more than a thousand times. And now, for our Brownstone Theatre presentation of Cyrano de Bergerac. On a night in 1640, a great audience representative of all of Paris is assembled in the Royal Theatre, but the show does not go on. Cyrano de Bergerac, a swaggering Gascon swordsman with a monstrous nose, suddenly appeared and goaded off the stage the leading actor whom he happens to despise. In the midst of the ensuing hubbub, a disappointed busybody attempts to register a protest. Cyrano retorts. You may go now, but... uh, You may go. Well, tell me why you are staring at my nose. Well, no, no, I... uh... Does it astonish you? Well, your Christmas understands, well... Is it long and soft and dangling like a trunk? I never said... Or crooked like an owl's beak? uh, Perhaps a pimple ornaments the end of it? Oh, no. Or a fly... Parading up and down? Uh, what is this portent? Oh, uh, this phenomenon. But I've been careful not to look. And why not, if you please? Why, it, it disgusts you then? Oh, no, not in the least. Possibly you find it just a trifle large. Oh, no, no, small, very small. Uh, uh, infinitesimal. Small? My nose? Well, you pug, you knob, you buttonhead. No, that I glory in this nose of mine. For a great nose indicates a great man. <laughs> Comte de Guiche, the most highly placed and influential of the enemies of Cyrano, has been looking on with disapproval. His follower, Valver, offers to take up the challenge. Observe. I myself will proceed to put him in his place. Uh, your nose. <clears throat> your nose is rather large. Rather. Oh, well. Is that all? Oh. Ah, no, young sir. You are too simple. Why, you might have said, oh, a great many things. Mon Dieu, why waste your opportunity? Uh, for example, thus. Aggressive. I sir, if that nose were mine, I'd have it amputated on the spot. Descriptive. It is a rock, a crag, a cape. A cape. Uh, say, rather, a peninsula. Inquisitive. Uh, what is that receptacle? A razor case or a portfolio? Kindly. Ah, do you love the little birds so much that when they come and sing to you, you give them this to perch on? <laughs> Dramatic. When it bleeds, the Red Sea. Enterprising. What a sign for some perfumer. Lyric. Hark, the horn of Roland calls to summon Charlemagne. <laughs> Simple. Uh, when do they unveil the monument? Respectful. Sir, I recognize in you a man of parts, a man of prominence. These, my dear sir, things you might have said, had you some tinge of letters or of wit to color your discourse. But wit, not so you never had an atom. And of letters, you need but three to write you down an act. Oh, these arrogant grand airs. A clown who, look at him, not even gloves, no ribbons, no lace, no buckles on his shoes. I carry my adornments on my soul. I do not dress up like a popping jay. 
but inwardly I keep my daintiness. I go caparisoned in gems unseen, trailing white plumes of freedom, garlanded with my good name. No figure of a man, but a soul clothed in shining armor, hung with deeds for decorations. Twirling thus a bristling wit, and swinging at my side courage, and on the stones of this old town, making the sharp truth ring like golden spurs. But you... But I have no gloves. A pity, too. I had one, the last one of an old pair, and lost that. A very careless of me. Some gentleman offered me an impertinence. I left it in his face. Dolt, bumpkin, fool, insolent puppy, chavanel. Ah, yes. And I... Cyrano Savinia Hercule de Bergerac. Buffoon. Well, what now? I must do something to relieve these cramps. This is what comes of lack of exercise. What is all this? And my sword has gone to sleep. So be it. You shall die exquisitely. Poet. Oh, yes, the poet, if you will. So while we fence, I'll make you a ballad extempore. A ballad? Uh, yes. I'll compose one while I fight with you. And at the end of the last line... Thrust hope. Will you? I will. Uh, stop. Uh, let me choose my rhymes. Uh, hmm. Now, here we go. Lightly, I toss my hat away. Languidly over my arm, let fall the cloak that covers my bright array. Then out, sword, and to work with all. A Lancelot in his lady's hall. A Spartacus at the hippodrome. I dally a while with you, dear Jack All. Then, as I end the frame, thrust hope. Where shall I skewer my peacock? Nay, better for you to have shunned this brawl. Hit in the heart, through your ribbon gay. In the belly, under your silken shawl. Hark how the steel rings musical. Mark how my point floats, light as the foam, ready to drive you back to the wall. Then, as I end the refrain, thrust hope. Prince, pray God that is Lord of all, pardon your soul, for your time has come. Beat, pass, fling you a slant, a sprawl. Then, as I end the refrain, thrust hope. Stop. After the duel, Cyrano and his bosom friend, Le Bray, are left alone for a moment. Cyrano says something to indicate that he might be in love. Astonished by this revelation, Le Bray says... What? Is it possible for me to love? I love. Well, may I know? You never said whom I love. Think a moment. Think of me. Me, whom the plainest woman would despise. Me, with this nose of mine that marches on before me by a quarter of an hour. Whom should I love? Why, of course, it must be the woman in the world, the most beautiful. Most beautiful? In all this world. Most sweet also, most wise, most witty, and most fair. Madeleine Aubert, your cousin? Yes. Rapsar. Well, why not? If you love her, tell her so. You've covered yourself with glory in her eyes this very day. My old friend, look at me and tell me how much hope remains for me with this protuberance. Oh, I have no more illusions. Now and then, but... I may grow tender, walking alone in the blue cool of evening, through some garden, fresh with flowers after the benediction of the rain. My poor big devil of a nose inhales April. And so I follow with my eyes where some boy, with a girl upon his arm, passes a patch of silver. And I feel somehow, I wish I had a woman too. Walking with little steps under the moon and holding my arm, so, and smiling, then I dream and I forget. And then I see the shadow of my profile on the wall. My friend. A friend I have my bitter days, knowing myself so ugly, so alone. Love is no more than chance. Speak to her, speak man. Who I knows? She might laugh at me. Cyrano receives a message from Roxanne, his cousin and the woman he adores. She asks him to meet her. He makes an appointment for the following morning. Cyrano can hardly restrain himself till she arrives. 
When she comes, his heart leaps up to welcome her. Blessed, above all others, be the hour that you remembered to remember me and came to tell me. What? Before I can tell you, are you, I wonder, still the same big brother almost that you used to be when we were children, playing by the pond in the old garden down there? I remember every summer you came to Bergerac. In those days, you did everything I wished. Was I pretty? Oh, not too plain. Now, uh, tell me what you're going to tell me. Mm-hmm. I love someone. Ah. Someone who does not know. Ah. At least, not yet. Ah. But he will know someday. Ah. A big boy who loves me, too, and is afraid of me and keeps away and never says one word. Ah. Besides, he is a soldier, too, in your own regiment. Ah. Yes, and the guards, your company, too. Ah. And such a man. He is proud, noble, young, brave. Beautiful. Beautiful? What's the matter? Nothing. Well, I love him. That is all. Oh, and I never saw him anywhere except the comedy. You've never spoken? Only our eyes. Why, then, how do you know? People talk about people, and I hear things, and I know. Say he's in the guards? Yes, a new recruit. His name? Baron Christian de Nervier. But, my dear child, for all you know, the man may be a savage or a fool. Not with such eyes. You brought me here to tell me this. I do not yet quite understand, madame, the reason for your confidence. They say that in your company, it frightens me. You're all Gascon. And we pick a quarrel with any flat foot who intrudes himself, whose blood is not pure Gascon like our own. Is this what you have heard? Yes. And I thought you, whom they all fear. Oh, well. I will defend your little baron. Will you? Just for me? Because I've always been your friend? Of course. Will you be his friend? I will be his friend. I know his heart broken at finding that Roxanne loves someone other than himself. But he promises her that he will make sure that Christian shall write to her with regularity. And she leaves. Then Le Bray drops in and reproaches Cyrano for insulting men in high places who might be able to help him toward preferment. Cyrano retorts, well, What would you have me do? Seek for the patronage of some great man? Like a creeping vine on a tall tree, crawl upward where I cannot stand alone? No, thank you. Eat a toad for breakfast every morning? Make my knees callous and cultivate a supple spine? Wear out my belly groveling in the dust? No, thank you. Be the patron saint of a small group of literary souls who dine together every Tuesday? No, I thank you. Shall I find true genius only among geniuses? palpitate over little paragraphs and struggle to insinuate my name into the columns of the Mercury? No, thank you. Calculate, scheme, be afraid, love more to make a visit than a poem, seek introductions, favors, influences? No, thank you. No, I thank you. And again, I thank you. But to sing, to laugh, to dream, to walk in my own way and be alone, free, with an eye to see things as they are, a voice that means manhood. To cock my hat where I choose. And a word, a yes or no, to fight. Or right to travel any road under the sun, under the stars. Never to make a line I have not heard in my own heart. Yet with all modesty to say, my soul be satisfied with flowers, with fruit, with weeds even. But gather them in the one garden you may call your own. So when I win a triumph by some chance, Render no share to Caesar. In a word, I am too proud to be a parasite. I stand not high, it may be, but alone. Yes. Tell this to all the world, and then to me say very softly that she loves you not. Huh. Hush. Cyrano makes himself known to Christian who's overjoyed at finding that Roxanne at least is interested in him. But when he hears that she expects him to write letters to her, he is dismayed, because he has no gift for words. I am one of those... those men who never can make love. Strange. Now, it seems I, if I gave my mind to it, uh, I might perhaps make love well. Oh, I wish I had your wit. Borrow it, then. Your beautiful young manhood... Lend me that, and we too make one hero of romance. 
What? Would you dare repeat to her the words I gave you day by day? You mean... I mean, Roxanne shall have no disillusionment. Come, shall we win her both together? Guided and instructed by Cyrano, Christian at first does fairly well with his courtship of Roxanne. Till in a spasm of self-confidence, he suddenly rebelled. No, I say, I've had enough taking my words and my letters all from you. It was a game at first. Now she cares. Thanks to you. I'll speak for myself now. Hmm, undoubtedly. I'm no fool. At least I know enough to take a woman in my arms. But Christian's lovemaking goes haltingly without the aid of Cyrano. And Roxanne, on the balcony outside her room, grows colder and colder toward the stammering lover who is now shrouded in darkness in the garden below. At last, as Roxanne chides him for his awkwardness, Christian despair allows Cyrano to speak for him. Your words do not hesitate. Why? Through the warm summer gloom, they grope in darkness toward the light of you. Let me enjoy the one moment I ever, my one chance to speak to you, unseen. Unseen? Yes, uh, yes, a night making all things dimly beautiful. One veil over us both. You see only the darkness of a long cloak in the gloom. And I, the whiteness of a summer gown. You're all light. I am all shadow. How can you know what this moment means to me? If I was ever eloquent... You were eloquent. You've never heard till now my own heart speaking. Love, I love beyond breath, beyond reason, beyond love's own power of loving. Your name is like a golden bell hung in my heart. And when I think of you, I tremble. The bell swings. And ring, Ruxan, Ruxan, along my veins, Ruxan. Yes, that is love. Can you feel my soul there in the darkness? Breathe on me. Oh, but tonight, now I dare say these things. It is too much. In my most sweet, unreasonable dreams, I have not hope for this. It is my voice, mine, my own, that makes you tremble there in the green gloom above me. For you do tremble as a blossom among the leaves. You tremble, and I can feel all the way down along these jasmine branches, whether you will or no, the passion of you. Trembling. Yes, I do tremble, and I weep, and I love you, and I am yours. And you have made me that. What is death like, I wonder? I know everything else now. Thanks to the ardent wooing of Cyrano, Roxanne's heart is won, and she and Christian are secretly married. But almost immediately, the company of cadets to which both Cyrano and Christian belong is called away to fight the Spaniards. Some days later, on the eve of their first dangerous engagement, Christian seeks out Cyrano. Roxanne Cyrano. I should like to say farewell to her with my whole heart written for her to keep. I thought of that. I have written your farewell. Show me. You wish to read it? Of course. Oh, here. Look. A tear. I so it is. Oh, <clears throat> this letter, as you see, I've made so pathetic that I wept while I was writing it. You wept? Oh, yes, because it is a little thing to die, but not to see her. That is terrible. Suddenly, Roxanne appears up in the field, having driven through the military lines to visit Christian. Battle begins. In the very first charge, Christian is killed. And on his body, Roxanne finds the letter which Cyrano had written as Christian's farewell to her. A letter over his heart for me. And on his letter, blood. And tears. His blood. His tears.
Fourteen years have passed, and Roxana's retired to a convent where she lives in deep mourning with the farewell letter of her lover lying ever at her heart. Every Saturday, promptly at six, Cyrano visits her in the convent garden, but today he is delayed. But on his way, a servant of one of his many enemies has dropped from a window a heavy log upon his head. While Roxanne sits waiting for him, Cyrano appears, his great plumed hat drawn low over his bandaged head. Very near to death, he sinks into his accustomed chair under the great tree. After 14 years late, for the first time? Yes, yes, maddening. I was detained by... Well? A visitor, a most unexpected. Did you tell him to go away? For the time being, yes. I said, uh, excuse me, this is Saturday. I have a previous engagement. One I cannot miss, even for you. Come back an hour from now. Your friend will have to wait. I shall not let you go till dark. Perhaps a little before dark. I must go. Tell me now the court news, my gazette. Well, let me see. Ah, Saturday the 19th. The king fell ill after eight helpings of great marmalade. His malady was brought before the court, found guilty of high treason, whereupon his majesty revived the royal pulse is now normal. Sunday the 20th. The queen gave a grand ball at which they burned 763 wax candles. Note, they say our troops have been victorious in Austria. Later. You have fainted. Serenor. Uh, uh, Serenor. What is it? Oh, no, no, no. It's nothing, truly. But... My old wound. Sometimes, you know... My poor friend. We all have our old wounds. I have mine here under this faded scrap of writing. It is hard to read now. All but the blood and the tears. His letter. Did you not promise me that someday, that someday you would let me read it? His letter? You, you wish... I do wish it uh, today. Yeah. May I open it? Open it and read. Farewell, Rathan, because today I die. Oh, no. I know that it will be today, my own dearly beloved. My heart still so heavy with love I have not told. And I die without telling you. No more shall my eyes drink the sight of you like wine. Never more with a look that is a kiss follow the sweet grace of you. How you read it. Here's letter. I remember now the way you have of pushing back a lock of hair with one hand from your forehead. My heart cries out. His letter. And you read it so... Cries out and keeps crying. Farewell, my dear, my dear. In a voice? My own heart. Own my own treasure. In such a voice? My love. As I remember hearing. Long ago. I'm never away from you. Even now I shall not leave you. In another world, I shall be still that one who loves you, loves you beyond measure, beyond... How can you read now? It is dark. And all these 14 years you've been the old friend who came to me to be amusing. Roxanne. It was you. No, no, Roxanne, no. It was you. I swear. I understand everything now. I never loved you. Yes, you love me. No, he loved you. Even now you love me. No, no, my own dear love. I love you not. Why were you silent for so many years? All the while, every night and every day, he gave me nothing. You knew that. You knew here in this letter lying on my breast. Your tears. You knew they were your tears. The blood was his. Why do you break that silence now, today? Why? Oh, because... And that faintness... Was that... Oh, no, nothing. I did not finish my gazette. Saturday, 26. An hour or so before dinner, Monsieur de Bergerac died, foully murdered. Oh, no. What have they done to you? Struck down by the sword of a hero, let me fall. Steel in my heart and laughter on my lips. Yes, I said that once. Our fate loves a jest. Behold me ambushed, taken in the rear... 
my battlefield a gutter, my noble foe a lackey with a log of wood. It seems too logical. I have missed everything, even my death. Well, I must go. Pardon. I cannot say. I never loved but one man in my life. And I've lost him. Twice. Not here. Not lying down. Let no one help me. No one. Only the tree. It is coming. I feel already shod with marble. Gloved with lead. Let the old fellow come now. He shall find me on my feet. Sword in hand. No, no. I can see him there. He grins. He's looking at my nose. That skeleton. What's that you say? Hopeless. Well, very well, but a man does not fight merely to win. No, no. Better to fight. To no one fights in vain. Who there? Who are you? A hundred against one? I know you now. My ancient enemies. Arthur! There! There! Fight it! Compromise! Charge it! What's that? No. Surrender? No, never, never. Ah, you too. Vanity. I knew you would overthrow me in the end. No. I fight on. I fight on. I fight on. Yes. All my laurels you have driven away. And all my roses. Yet in spite of you, there is one crown I bear away with me. And tonight, when I enter before God, my salute shall sweep all the stars away from the blue threshold. One thing without stain, unspotted from the world. In spite of doom, mine own. And that is... Thank you. My white plume. We have sat together in the Brownstone Theatre for this performance of scenes from Cyrano de Bergerac with Walter Hamden, the Cyrano, and Gertrude Warner as Roxanne. It has been a great joy for me to hear once more this exhilarating play by Edmond Rostand and his noble English translation by Brian Hooker, which was adapted for radio by our producer, Jack McGregor. The music was directed by Sylvan Levin. For this performance, we bring the spring season of the Brownstone Theatre to a close, but we look forward to reopening soon again. Meanwhile, we should be grateful for your comments on our plays and your suggestions for plays to be produced in the future. We are deeply grateful also for the many letters we have already received in our first season. In behalf of all of us at the Brownstone Theatre, I wish to thank you for your generous support. And so, until the Brownstone Theatre returns to the air, I bid you all good night. Clayton Hamilton was your host for the Brownstone Theater Productions, which came to you from New York. Next Wednesday evening at this time, we shall broadcast Spotlight Bands, which will be heard regularly over Mutual, Mondays and Wednesdays, beginning next Monday evening, June 18th. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.